Welcome one and all to another episode of The Damage Report with me, John Iderola. But forget all that, that's not important. We like to give you treats from time to time. And usually we save them like for a Friday. We decided, no, we're not waiting. We want a big Thursday. So you know what we have for you today? The epic return of Senator Nina Turner. Nina, how's it going? John, that is the best intro ever. I'm doing <laughs> mighty fine. How are you, darling? I'm doing well. I've been very excited to see uh, you popping up on uh, different shows across the network uh, in the recent past. And I know everybody's excited about what's coming in one month and two days, I believe it is. The debut of Unbossed. Do you want to tell us about your upcoming show? Yes, looking forward to it. So Unbossed, we're going to expose the corruption. Imagine that. That is happening in our world, but we're also going to talk about some some good things too in the way that people can fight and push back. So it won't be all doom and gloom, but we're going to point out some of the failures in our system, reinforce that many of the these things are systemic, and that we have the power to change them. And we're going to dabble a little bit, John, into some some good human interest stories because you Mm -hmm. know we talk about the bad stuff all the time. I want to. I want to throw some good in there too. You're hundred percent right. And I know that people have, have always credited you as being able to strike that balance of making sure that the news is not just an endless draining grind that we recognize when people are doing good stuff, when good stuff, ha- uh, good stuff happens. Actually, we're going to have a, a story in the, the last half hour of the show, what we call the aftermath now um, of some people responding to uh, a movie trailer that just came out that just, like, it makes me so happy to see it. So we're going to try to do a little bit of that today. Um, but just to talk a little bit more uh, about Unbossed, uh, you know, forgetting anybody at TYT, because I know you're going to be bringing on guests and everything. Outside of TYT, who are some people you're interested in bringing on to Unbossed? Definitely interested in bringing Dr. Cornell West, who I know is a favorite of TYT, certainly one of my favorites, uh, Dr. Derek Hamilton, who's a stratification economist and links uh, the economy with doing good and the role that government can play in doing that good. So it's going to be, and I'm, 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 I am also going to interview some some everyday people as well, John. So I'm looking forward to that. I want to do some small business segments and that kind of stuff. So stay tuned. I want to give it all away but it is really going to be good. Dr. Kimberly Crenshaw, you know, she is the uh, mother of, if you will, critical race theory. So we're going to have some really hot guests. Looking forward to it. Oh, no. Unbossed is definitely going to get protested by the right wing then (laughs) if it's teaching critical race theory. (laughs) I'm looking forward to it. Oh, my God. When they find out that your show is going to feature critical race theory and we're going to start doing Drag Queen Story Hour on the Damage Report, their minds are going to (laughs) blow But anyway, um, now I'm very excited for it. I know uh, my dog, Abby, heard that you're on the show and she's barking in excitement right now. So both humans and the animal kingdom can't wait. And you don't have to wait very long. It's coming up October 17th, so everybody stay tuned for that. But on today's edition, what's that? (laughs) I got to thank Abby. (laughs) Thanks, Abby. Don't worry. It's going to be cool. Anyway, um, on today's episode of the show, we've got a lot to talk about right now. Uh, Good news, actually, when it comes to what looked like an impending strike. Uh, Marjorie Greene's uh, assurance that Republicans don't want to do anything to curtail abortion rights. She looks even more ridiculous now uh, in light of what many Republicans are saying and doing. Bad news when it comes to... To QAnon Shore, Nancy Pelosi bowing to pressure. We're going to jump into that. That's a lot of fun. And uh, we're going to be closing out the first hour with one of the most entitled cops that I've seen in a long time. So that's going to be our version of fun. And then, of course, you've got the aftermath. We're going to have fun with that, too. In advance of all that, if you wouldn't mind hitting the like button and sharing the stream so that people know we're live, that would be great. And if you want to send uh, either myself or Nina messages, super chats, uh, comments, I see many of you already are. Um, we'll respond as we go. But with all that said, Nina, are you ready to start the show? I am ready, John. Okay, let's do it. Let's jump into some good news. So for a little bit, you've been worried about the possibility of a massive strike that seemed certainly justified by the experience of many rail workers, but would, of course, have some negative ramifications when it comes to the economy. Now, 
there have been this big back and forth for some time between the railroad companies and the union workers. Um, we've been talking about this on both TDR and the main show some time now. Well, apparently, as of this morning, it's not going to happen, they say. So we're going to dive into the little bit of details we have right now and see what we think and where we think this might go. Apparently now there had been 20 hours of talks trying to head off the strike, which would have happened within just 24 hours of now. Uh, the White House has announced that it's not going to happen. There is, a, in fact, a tentative deal between freight rail operators and their unions. And so uh, it is now going to go to the unions for a vote. Now, supposedly, they have some assurance that the unions and their membership are going to support it, although that could end up not to be the case. And things could change, so we will have to see. But the parties also agreed to a post-ratification cooling off period of several weeks to ensure that if a vote doesn't succeed, the rails keep running. So normally in a situation like this, you would expect that uh, if they're saying we're going to strike by X date and then supposedly they have a deal and the deal falls through and after that date, the strike would then happen. It would immediately um, uh, go into effect. What they want to do is try to create this buffer period where if the vote does fail, there can be another round of negotiations potentially averting a strike in the near future. Um, but we're, we're going to jump into the details of what the unions were able to get. But Nina, I know this is a story that that is important to you. So what do you think about the fact that apparently we've averted that strike? Yeah, I'm glad that we did, John. A lot of pain. and People forget how instructively we are linked to our sisters and brothers and family and friends who work in the rail industry. I mean, you talk about halting the economy, shutting down. We're already dealing with supply chain issues. This would have just exacerbated explosion, you know, and so I'm really happy that they have uh, come to some agreement, not particularly for the workers themselves, John, because that is, you know, the things that they were talking about, no off days, you know, one man crews or one you know person crews not being paid what they deserve a lot we were, i remember i'm old enough to remember they are considered essential workers well they should be treated like essential workers and it really should have never come to this that they got to beg and grovel at the feet of the the big corporate you know interests the ceos that make money hand over fist and let me shout out senator bernard sanders on this one too he was giving it to him he was taking it all the way to the hole on these people. And John, if I could, you know, the, in a floor speech that he gave before this agreement, he pointed out that last year, the rail industry spent over $18 billion to buy back stock, his own stock for his stockholders. And then since 2010, the rail industry has spent $183 billion on stock buyback, buybacks and dividends. Now that was in an earlier speech and I, and I know we may show something else from the Senator, but thank God for people like, Senator Sanders and the workers themselves, because that's that's key, yeah. who were willing to stand up and demand more. And this wave of union workers, John, standing up for better benefits, better wages and better work conditions is taking hold in this country. And it is indeed a beautiful thing because it helps all workers, whether they're unionized or not. Yeah, and any victory like this is going to inspire workers, you know, in, in other industries. And you can add it on to a list of, you know, successful uh, you know, labor uh, movements uh, in places like, you know, uh, obviously Starbucks and a little bit in Amazon and John Deere and, you know, the, like the, the hits keep coming and you love to see it. Uh, the fact that Bernie Sanders is standing with them is in no way surprising, but I do love that he has been regularly speaking on this literally yesterday an impassioned speech. And, you know, obviously he, he's just one person. You have to give most of the credit to the unions themselves that the were workers, willing to take yeah. this risk, willing to be, right. you know, attacked by the industry, by the government, potentially by pundits. How dare you do this in a time of inflation? And we already have supply chain issues. Um, and I remember when they had uh, sort of set up the path to this deal, I think it was one or two months ago. And uh, I, I did a video at the time where I talked about how most people obviously are not rail workers, okay? And so it would be very easy, even for other working class people to be like, yeah, you know, I want them to have these conditions, but I'm already paying so much. I don't want to pay more. And I try to remind everyone that like our interests are linked up and any strike in any industry is going to have ripple effects and it's going to hurt a little bit but we need to be willing to support our fellow workers, you know, because the industry is always going to be there to try to divide us, to say that the interests of 
uh, flight attendants and the interests of rail workers don't line up. And if you're a barista, that's a totally different thing. And if you're a teacher, why would you care what happens to the nurses? We are all the workers of America. And so we have to have each other's backs. And and in this case, it worked. You know, people didn't seem to be freaking out. And of course, you know, they, they were bene- there was the benefit of, you know, for all the issues with Joe Biden, I imagine this process would have been a little bit different with Donald Trump. I don't know, would would they have been like a, a day before instead of an agreement, maybe we would just have a ton of federal agents ready to crack skulls or something. Like, I don't know for sure, but I'm glad we went in this direction instead. That could have been possible, John. And there's nothing like good old midterms to make politicians do yes. the right thing. That is really the elephant in the room is that you got midterms. Uh, coming up and they were forced to act and to act very quickly. And sometimes good politics make for good policies. I still want to see the feds go even further. My contention is that it should have never come to this and shame on the CEOs of these railway companies putting their employees through this. The fed, the feds need to do something to make sure, you know, to, to try to make more buffers so that rail workers don't even have to face uh, this moving forward. It really yeah. is a shame. Well, let's talk now about the little bit we have of the details. And and it's it's mostly broad at this yeah. point. We'll have to find out more and we'll have to see what the actual union membership thinks about it. But uh, in what's being called a first, the agreement, quote, provides our members with the ability to take, to take time away from work to attend a routine and preventative medical care, as well as exemptions from attendance policies for hospitalizations and surgical procedures. The fact that that can be described as a first is bonkers. Um, you know, let's imagine that we weren't in the third year of a public health crisis, an ongoing pandemic with a little side of monkey pop pox rippling around the edges. Uh, you should be able to take time off if you're sick or if you need to be hospitalized. That should not need to be explained. But the fact that they need to fight for this years into a pandemic, as Nina said, essential workers, You know, I I have to imagine the job of rail workers probably made more difficult by a couple of years where everybody's shopping online even more and all that. They should not have to be fighting for these things. And it's a reminder, by the way, that while generally these actions, um, they're they're focused around overall pay, these sorts of benefits can be even more important in some cases. Like some of these rail workers might be making okay money, but if you literally can't sleep because you have to be on call 24-7, what does it matter at the end of the day what your pay is? You're living at best a half life at that point. They also did get pay increases. The board has recommended a pay increase of 7% this year, as well as retroactive increases for the previous two years, and two more raises in 2023 and 2024 of 4 and 4.5%, as well as an annual $1,000 service recognition uh, bonus. Rail workers will also get a series of wage increases amounting to a 24% pay bump by 2024. Now, I, of course, will leave it uh, t- apparently we're having some sort of stream problems. I apologize. I am not, in fact, drunk. That's the stream. Um, I-, I will leave it to the rail workers to decide if that's enough, if that's in line with what they wanted. It sounds pretty good in comparison to what we've seen from deals like this in the past. Um, and so overall, again, it's not on me. This is the sort of story I was telling you before the show where I just want to wait and see what the union thinks. But it sounds pretty good. And and maybe it is like you say, maybe Maybe Joe Biden wouldn't have felt the pressure to do this if the uh, primary wasn't within the next two months. But but good, you know, a benefit of us having so many elections, maybe that we were able to get this. Yeah, we'll take it, John. It might not be as pristine as we want it, but we will definitely take it. And you're right. I'm I'm I am right with you. It is up to the rail workers to decide whether or not this is good enough. But it really is shameful. I want people to think about this. There's no patent on the backs of the of the company heads on this because they should have had this all along. How mm-hmm. what kind of civilized society do you have where people can't take sick time without being penalized? They didn't even talk about paid sick leave, John, which we should have paid sick sick leave in this country. We are a hegemonic nation and it is cruel and unusual punishment at this point for any worker not to have paid sick leave, to have paid family leave. Life happens to everybody. It really is a damn shame, John. I know that's as harsh as I can go uh, Mm. on this show, (laughs) but I want people to understand what they were fighting for and what they are fighting for is what the hell they deserve. They only getting what they deserve and they shouldn't have had to have have fought for this, but 
here we are in the 21st century in America where CEOs make hundreds of millions of dollars while the workers have to grovel. The workers that make the machine run have to grovel. Yeah. So, but, but you know what, John? The good side of this is that, hey, solidarity, baby, and that the worker is, is determining now. They're using their power. And that is the beautiful thing coming out of this. I hope they don't stop. 100%. Yeah, and, and really briefly before we move on, because we've got a fun video to go to, uh, again, if I could just return to Bernie Sanders, like, so Bernie should have been the nominee in 2016. He should have been the nominee in yes. 2020, especially. Yes. But look at, like, so he wasn't, and look at how he spent his time since then. Like, this is exactly, like, think, you know, obviously Hillary Clinton is not, like, a serving senator, but she went off and she's doing her speeches, and she's, like, like in the woods or whatever, Trump lost re-election. What is he doing for conservatives? He was like, golfing. He was golfing. He's golfing and stealing John. documents. Bernie yeah. is doing exactly what you would want. A person who said, I'm going to do these things if I'm president. Okay, I'm not president. You know what I'm going to do? I'm still going to try to deliver on those exact same things because I care about the results, not about myself. That's anyway. exactly right. There yeah. it is. David, we did reach out to the Association of American Railroads, and they say that workers get sick days and paid time off. Uh, but what I want to talk to you about is what does this mean for Americans if you do go on strike? Well, what whoever told you we get six day, our sick days is manipulating the data. We get paid time off that we earned the previous year before. Before the new policy came about, we were allowed to take five days off and two weekend days off a month. Now we could take virtually one day unpaid off a month. And then the only other time we could take off is our paid time that we had to earn the previous year. Yeah, that does seem ridiculous. They would never let airline pilots do that. Um, we're some... not asking, we're not asking for the world here. We're asking for a few days off a month to spend with our family instead of living on a train. We spend. 240 to 260 hours a month sitting on these trains or sitting at the hotel rooms wow. away from our families. That's wow. When I leave my house to go to work, I'm gone for at least two to two and a half to three days. I didn't come realize home, that, David. I, I and then so, I come home and I'm only allowed to be home for 10 hours. I absolutely love that video. That is a rail worker being interviewed on Newsmax. And and take a look at how that video started and take a look at how it ended. The, the host there started off by Saying, uh, oh, to be clear, rail workers get sick leave. And also, forget about that. Let's focus on how is this going to hurt other Americans? Like, so trying to frame this potential strike, because this happened uh, more than a day ago, um, as being a bad thing. And then he just gives the, the honest life experience of a rail worker. And when you hear it said out loud, even the Newsmax hosts have to be like, wow, that does sound crazy. How, how can we allow that? I didn't know that, but it sounds crazy. And I think that's a reasonable, honest response when you actually talk to one of these workers. People like that worker are almost never brought on to the news, maybe to avoid moments like this, Nina, but I love to see it because I think it'll open up a lot of people's eyes, a lot of conservatives' eyes in this case. I do too. It was a thing of beauty, John. I'm just going to let that stand on its own, a thing of beauty. Yeah. Uh, you know, it, it makes me think of like when we've had previous periods where there will be a national conversation about potentially raising like the minimum wage. And obviously the vast majority of, uh, you know, news personalities that make hundreds of thousands, if not millions of dollars are almost universally against it. Or at the very least, they will frame the conversation around how that could hurt employment or how that. Could... But what is almost always lost in these rare moments where as a country we consider stopping on this topic is they don't interview people who make minimum wage. They talk about those people, they talk at those people, but they don't really interview those people. And so, well, like, why why do they have so many, like, well, I was gonna say so many conversations about climate change, they generally don't, but when they do, where well, they don't bring on climate scientists, like, so much of the news pretends that there aren't people whose entire life is about these topics. And I think for the companies that have the resources, that have massive booking departments and so much money and they can they can satellite people in, you could bring in people who are living the experience of the story you're talking about on virtually every topic, but they almost never choose to do that. I guess they need more time with Jeffrey Lord or something. I don't know, Nina. No, it doesn't fit the narrative, John. That's why we don't see it. You know, one of uh, the movies, Few Good Men, <laughs> where one of the characters said, you can't handle the truth. 
that's really what we're dealing with right now when it comes to mainstream media in particular. They can't handle the truth. And when you have more people on, like that gentleman we just heard from, oh, you're going to get the truth. And that will start to change people's minds because people do uh, open up more when it's somebody that is going through the situation that we are talking about. And it's hard to refute anything that man said about his experience working as a, as a worker on, on the, on the, on the rail. hundred percent. Well, with that said, we do have to take our first break. We're apparently going to take uh, some sort of tech break. Uh, hopefully when we come back, we'll be able to respond to some of your comments, but don't go anywhere. We got some great stuff, including updates on the Republican attempt to flee from their actual position on abortion after this. <laughs> Because they believe the way to drive people to the polls is by scaring them. They're lying to women all over America saying that they can't have an abortion anymore, which that's a lie. There's plenty of places that women can easily get an abortion. They're lying to, to gay Americans saying that Republicans are trying to take away gay marriage when that's not something. I haven't even seen a bill that says anything like that. That's a little throwback for you to earlier this week. Marjorie Green assuring everyone, don't freak out. Don't turn against the Republican Party. We don't want to take away your abortion rights. I mean, it's only the position that I hold as Marjorie Green. It's only the thing that our movement has been trying to do for 50 years. We just killed Roe v. Wade, and we're definitely going to try to go further than that. But don't turn against us. So that's what she's saying. And honestly, politically, it's pretty savvy for her. Uh, to be willing to be so dishonest about what she wants the government to do to save the electoral prospects of the Republicans. And that is why I love that virtually every other Republican across the country is trying to make a fool out of her. So she says that, and then what happens? Marco Rubio, sitting senator, uh, announces he's going to be co-sponsoring Graham's federal abortion ban. So Rubio, he was a presidential contender. He could be in the future. He thinks the future of the Republican Party is a national ban on abortion. But not just the sitting senators. Herschel Walker says he's all in on a federal abortion ban. And uh, he says, by the way, I believe the issue should be decided at the state level, but I would support this policy. Now, Herschel Walker, of course, is uh, deranged. And so that means that he can be a little bit more accidentally honest than most of the Republicans. He just said the whole thing right there. I believe it should be a state issue if it needs to be, and I believe it should be a federal issue if it can be. That's all it is. Wherever we can ban it, we will ban it. By the way, Walker, he goes beyond even the others. He doesn't back, ex he wants a full abortion ban with no exceptions, not for rape, not for incest, not even to save a pregnant person's life. Like literally he would prefer that you die in the hospital. It's amazing. Sorry, Marjorie Green, that's your candidate. And of course, we wake up to the news that a near total abortion ban has taken effect in Indiana. And that, of course, follows the fact that just yesterday, West Virginia became the second state to pass a strict abortion ban post Roe. So if your job is to try to convince us that the Republican Party doesn't want to ban abortion, you better hope that we are not watching the news or listening to anything that's going on. Nina, what do you make of all this? Yeah, she's out of touch, and uh, they need to come and get her, John. I mean, seriously. <laughs> I don't think they want Please. it. Please. <laughs> Why make us suffer? No, you know, the Republicans are showing showing their, their true colors here. They've been planning this for a very long time. This didn't happen by accident. This didn't happen overnight. And, I mean, and what I mean by this, I mean the overturning of Roe v. Wade. And so it would be nice if, in fact... Uh, the Democratic Party would work to expand the Supreme Court because it's not just abortion. We have a whole host of issues that impact our representative democracy that will be in peril because of this conservative, out of touch Supreme Court. And the Congress and the president have it within their power right now. Let's not wait till November because we don't know what's going to happen in November. We know what the polls are saying. I know we're going to talk about that later. But power is to be used right now. And so expand the Supreme Court. It can be expanded. The number, I mean, this is not fixed forever. Rules are created. Rules can be recreated, John. And that's what mm -hmm. we're going to have to do to really, I believe, 
uh, help to save democracy in this country. Really fast, just because we're talking about reform of the Supreme Court there. Um, I don't know if you've seen um, uh, Representative Hank Johnson, as well as a few others, have their bill to reform the Supreme Court. What they want to do is is change it so that you basically have an 18 year year term, and every presidential term, the president gets two appointments to the Supreme Court. What, what do you, but 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 it does keep the same number of uh, SCOTUS justices. What do you, what do you think about that? I mean, it might it's better than nothing. I would need to see a little more of it, but I'm glad that members of Congress are putting things out there to move us in that direction. The Supreme Court as it is cannot stand. It puts every single thing in peril in this country. And we're seeing that time and time again. Yeah, 100 percent. What What um, are your thoughts on that, John? What are your thoughts? I, look, I, I think if I could just snap my fingers and make that the system, that's the system that I would want. It's a system I've wanted for some time. It's similar to there, there was a great analysis of a couple different plans for Supreme Court reform that John Oliver covered on his show several years ago. But the idea that it would like the idea that you serve until you die, which obviously incentivizes choosing the youngest justice as possible. That's crazy. The fact that one president could get zero appointments and one could get three or more. That's crazy. And it has resulted in the last couple of presidencies of, of these huge conflicts over whether you even get to have a vote or not. And, uh, and and there's no reason to believe that that's not gonna continue. It should be a regular thing. You win the presidency, you get two. I'm not saying that that's the best possible system, but I think sure. that is a, such a massive improvement over what we have right now. Um, yeah. and, and it seems so reasonable that there's no chance whatsoever it's gonna happen. <laughs> well, at the time that the framers, you know, when the constitution was written, lifetime appointment and people weren't living as long as we are living today. That's, That's something to think about as well. Yeah. But yes, yeah, something is certainly better than what we have right now. That is for yeah. sure. Well, the, the good thing though, is that while, you know, as you pointed out uh, for a long time, we were, we were living longer and longer, um, uh, life expectancy is now dropping following the pandemic. So maybe this problem will sort itself out. Yeah. <laughs> maybe Ugh. John, but we'll, we don't want you saying just let Mother Nature handle this. <laughs> <laughs> By the way, though, um, if we could return to the candidates. So Mike Pence weighed in saying, I have every confidence that the next Republican president, whoever that may be, will stand for the right to life. It is imperative that Republicans and conservatives resolve here and now that we will not shrink from the fight. He's describing Marjorie Greene there, basically shrinking from the fight, pretending they don't want to fight on that. Um, I love, by the way, that he doesn't even mention Trump. Like Trump, he served with Trump for four years. He doesn't want to be president again. But um, I have no doubt that the next candidate will be calling for a national ban, whether it's Trump, whether it's DeSantis or whoever it may be. I think they will be calling for that. And so like Marjorie Greene is trying to be slick, trying to be savvy right now and being undercut every step of the way. And it's hilarious. But this is going to be an ongoing problem for them because they are caught between a rock in a crazy place. They don't want to talk openly about their views on abortion because they know how unpopular their views are. And yet they desperately need to placate their base, which isn't enough to win national elections on because those people are out of their GD mind. And so going forward, like how long can they hide it for? They're going to spend every primary season talking about how pro-life they are. And then every general election talking about how they won't do anything that can't stand. I don't think. No, it won't. And and Taylor Green is just being exposed for the fool that she is. Uh, when it comes to Pence, I mean, I think I might not uh, name the president I serve with if he was OK with me being lynched. OK, let's just go and yes. put that out there. So uh, good for Pence finally standing up a little bit, I guess. <laughs> and when it comes to right to life, I mean, what the hell, John, does that really mean when you don't care whether or not the children who are birthed into this world have food to eat, have shelter, whether or not their parents, hello, real world workers and nurses, you know, whether mm -hmm. their parents ha are making a living wage, have paid sick time off, you know, all of the things that make for a high quality life. So the GOP is not a pro-life party. They are pro-birth, suffer until you die party. That's all they are. And 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 this this fixation, this with just controlling women's bodies, because this is what this comes down to, John. It is control, total control, and this is total lunacy 100%. being displayed by the GOP right now in the 21st century. 
and 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 Marjorie Taylor Greene is the is the leader of the band. Yeah, she's the she's the vanguard. It's only going to get crazier from here. So everyone oh, buckle yeah. up. Okay, with that, we're going to turn to something very different. Whenever we're ready, uh, why don't we tee up this next video? These are people that don't like seeing what's going on in places like Portland and places like Chicago and New York and other cities and states. And uh, I've heard these are people that love our country and they just don't like seeing it. So I don't know really anything about it other than they do supposedly like me and they also would like to see problems in these areas, like especially the areas that we're talking about, go away. Because there's no reason the Democrats can't run a city. So that's a throwback to when, regrettably, tragically, Donald Trump was president. He was asked about QAnon. Um, and those of us who were worried about QAnon were told for years, why are you freaking out about this? Well, Trump would never encourage this. And it's such a small group of people. Well, no, he did encourage it. He pretended he didn't know that they think that virtually every Democrat in the country is a satanic child uh, rapist and perhaps cannibal. Um, and he did encourage it. And you know what's happened since then? It's gotten bigger and bigger and bigger. And so too has the death toll. So we're coming off of just within this last week, a man murdering his wife and shooting his daughter uh, after, according to the surviving daughter, being sucked down the Q rabbit hole. So that's how we entered this week. You know what Trump did to follow that up? He posted this on Truth Social, a QAnon meme. The storm is coming with Q on him and the when we go, one we go all. So after they killed another person and tried to wipe out a family, he gave a little wink and a nod, telling them that their theory that he secretly is in charge of everything and there's this plot where he's going to save the world, maybe it's true. I don't know. I'm just truthing about it. That's a fun way to greet the murder. Well, now, right after that, what happens? Another person who's a big QAnon fan in a clown wig went to a Pennsylvania Dairy Queen and said that he was going to restore Trump to President King. How? By killing Democrats and liberals. That's how. And the reason I wanted to play that earlier clip is that was Trump saying two things about QAnon. One, they love him. And the other is they don't like these Democrat areas. He listed in uh, the extended clip Chicago and a few of New York, a few other places. Democrats are ruining these places and they don't like that. And that, according to Trump, was the right stance to have. Well, now you have QAnon people saying they're not just going to kill their families anymore. No, they want to wipe out Democrats and liberals because they believe in all of this conspiratorial stuff that he has been encouraging. This guy, uh, Jan Stavoy, had a loaded handgun and extra ammo. He went into this Dairy Queen uh, saying he was going to get Trump back into the presidency by killing people. Now, how that would work, who knows? These are deranged people, okay? And that is why you should not be encouraging them, telling them that their apocalyptic conspiracy theories are true. Nina, what do you think? Yeah, John, I mean, he's getting these people amped up, and there are certain people in the world who are predisposed to take actions based on somebody in power, uh, you know, pushing them to do so. And that's exactly what. Donald J. Trump is doing. And if he loved this country the way that he purports to love this country, he would be out there right now because he is a media magnet even to this very moment, saying to people in QAnon and other uh, movements similar to this to stand down instead of telling them what to stand up and stand by, whatever the hell he said that day. Yep. But he's reveling in this. And this really is a shame that people are losing their lives over this the, a lie. And, and foolery and Donald Trump has within his power, but he, he'll never do it uh, is to bring the temperature down. And so all of us should be very afraid. Any, any of us could have been in that damn in the Dairy Queen. It's ridiculous. Yeah, 100 percent. We should we should be worried about this. And you never know where it's going to hit. And look, it, like I said, you know, when we were talking earlier this week about the guy who killed his family because of it, maybe these people were always going to be crazy, but maybe they didn't need to be spurred on to think right. that. There was a there was a legitimate moral, political, ethical reason they had to do these things, and the, and the 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 terrible thing is, in the same way that the right wing doubled down on uh, attacking the FBI after the guy attacked the FBI in Cincinnati, they're not going to stop. They're they're not going to be like a little bit more hesitant 
around QAnon after yet another series of killing, because this isn't the first. Last year, a QAnon follower killed his two children with a spear fishing gun after allegedly believing he had received secret signs that they would turn into monsters. Now, if that sounds to you like just normal crazy person stuff, it is, but it's also basically exactly the same as everything else about QAnon. The idea that we have these secret messages about satanic pedophiles and this, that's their entire thing. And this is literally tens of millions of people now who take this theory as seriously as you you watching this, you reasonable person, maybe you have thoughts about climate change or Medicare for all. They are just as serious about this as you are about those things. They're deranged, they're detached from reality, they're potentially murderous, but they believe it so hardcore. And the idea that all these people would be continually reinforcing their mind that that's true, it is terrible. There are, there's blood on their hands and it's there's just gonna be more and more. Any other thoughts? Agreed, John. No, you, you laid it out. Agreed. So we all have, must be vigilant. We got to be aware. And we got to keep pushing back against this kind of uh, behavior and rhetoric. It is very dangerous. Okay, we're going to take uh, the last break of the first hour. When we come back, we're going to have uh, hopefully a, a, a good next step on a topic we've been talking about for some time. That is the uh, insider uh, stock trading um, going on. Inside of Congress, we have an update on that, as well as this video, this cop, you're not going to want to miss it. So don't go anywhere. We'll be right back. Okay, man, this hour is racing by... Let's jump into something that could end up being positive. We're going to break it down, starting with this. I believe we have a product that we can bring to the floor this month. It, exciting. Well, you know what? When the bill comes out, you'll see what it is, and those are some of the discussions that go back and that go back and forth. But I'm 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 pleased with it. It's very strong. That is Nancy Pelosi talking about their upcoming new product, which she definitely seems enthusiastic about. We'll return to that. But the product is a ban on effectively insider trading by Congress people. And we don't know exactly what the bill is going to look like. We don't know exactly when it's going to come. But supposedly it is coming soon. And we have some idea of what it might look like. Um, a version of a legislative framework in the House was outlined back in a late August memo. And what it would do is effectively prohibit lawmakers, their spouses, and dependent children from making trades in individual stocks, bonds, cryptocurrencies, love to see that there, and other financial assets tied to specific companies. And so why is this coming? Well, it's coming because Nancy Pelosi is not in favor of people using their information to make money, and she has always been against that. I'm joking. Sorry. I like to mix in a little bit of comedy. No, she's gotten rich off of using the information she's gotten through her uh, position as a congresswoman. She's made a killing. Um, and she has generally uh, fought for months now efforts by both great reporters like an insider. Dave Leventhal comes on all the time to talk about insider trading of uh, elected officials, people like AOC and others who've been making a big deal out of this for for more than a year at this point. She has been dragging her heels and you can see it in the way that she spoke right there. It was so begrudging, so reluctant. But supposedly, mm -hmm. Nina, it's coming. We don't know if it'll make its way into law. Obviously, anything passing at this point seems difficult. But I do like that we're getting progress on stopping them from, you know, potentially using their insider access to personally enrich themselves. Yeah, I'm glad that they, you know, that she's standing up before the American public even talking about it. It did seem very excruciating. She, I mean, it felt like she was in pain <laughs> to even talk about it. You know, there was a big expose that the, the New York Times just recently did. I'm looking at the headline now. These 97 members of Congress reported trades in companies influenced by their committees. Well, 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 well. And we wonder why we have corruption in the system. Well, this is yet one very perfect example. And I want everyone to know that the system as it exists does not have to be that tomorrow. Just because it is this way today doesn't mean it has to be that way tomorrow, John. And kudos to all of the members of Congress who have been pushing and fighting 
all the watchdog groups who have been fighting for this. Hopefully we'll get something to done and that this is not just some show. Uh, I doubt that it is going to happen before the midterm elections. We are in uh, mid-September right now. Uh, they, they will be on break back in their districts and then it will be November and they'll say, oops, we ran out of time. We got to keep the pressure on these folks because it is it's corrupt. Bribery is legal in the United States of America. You can bribe politicians and they can insider tr- trade. And even yeah. as some people that we wouldn't even think would be involved, some of our friendly neighborhood Democrats are doing this too. So I just want folks yeah. to know this is not a partisan issue right here. This is an issue of corruption. 100%. I mean, as we've said, Nancy Pelosi has beaten the stock market year after year after year after year. I have to assume because she's just great at this stuff. It's not because of the yeah. information, I suppose. I don't know. But yeah, but, they, but um, you know what, John? The people in our neighborhoods, in the hoods, where, where they misunderstood, whether they rural, urban, or suburban hoods, they don't have this luxury. Mm-hmm. So when you want to talk about the system being rigged, John, we're given one example of why when we say that. This is just one of many examples we could talk about today. This is one very important example that the average citizen in this country does not have that benefit. They can't enrich themselves and that of their families because they can't inside a trade because they're not running the very committees that create the rules and be able to tell their their family members and their closest friends, hey, trade on this. They're doing it and it is wrong. It's immoral as hell, John, and it must be stopped. Yeah, 100 percent. And I'm glad that you brought up, by the way, that New York Times uh, reporting. So that obviously is going to be super high profile. I want to remind people that Dave Leventhal and his team at Insider have been doing like constant reporting about this for a couple of years now. But sure, the New York, so the New York Times has done a great look into it. Um, yeah. And it it doesn't seem like a coincidence that within 24 hours, Nancy Pelosi is, is announcing this thing because now there it's it national news. It's the New York Times, the paper of records talking about it. And so that's the power, a reminder, by the way, of the power of the media to make something an issue. Um, now, the only other thing I want to say about this, though, is and I wish we had time to go into some of the specific conflicts. Uh, we can't necessarily get this passed before the midterms, as Nina pointed out. You know what we could do, though, in theory? She can't make it a law, but before the midterms, she could make it a requirement to be a part of the Democratic caucus. Not just her. She's just the speaker. But her and other Democratic leaders could say, if you want to caucus with the Democrats, we're the anti-corruption party. Okay, that's what we are. So you're going to be forced to divest or put your, uh, your stocks, bonds, cryptocurrency in a blind trust or buy. We'll see you later. That's a requirement now to be a part of our party. She could do that. They could do that. Biden could push for that. That could be a strong signal to the electorate before the midterm that this is what you do if you're not corrupt. Hey, Republicans, what are you going to be doing? I would love to see that. But of course, that's not going to happen. That's beautiful, John. Let's get that memo over there from you, John. say to everyone out there, I'm speaking for myself, but I'm probably speaking for a large majority of other officers out there. If we're driving on the freeway in our police car, get the out of the way. Get the out of the way. If you merge and we follow behind you and we merge too, you're probably in trouble. Best way to find that out is get the out of the way. I can go 90 miles an hour. You can't. You can't do that. So get the out of the way. If us officers stay behind you long enough, we can find a reason to pull you over. So you might as well get the f- out of the way. Super simple. That's all. You're welcome. I want to give that cop to start off a little bit of credit for going a solid 45 seconds without beating an innocent person. That's good. Other than that, no credit. I cannot tell you, Nina, how much I despise everything that we just saw. All of what was encapsulated in that cop. And I have a lot to say about it, but I want to give you first crack. What did you think about this uh, cop's TikTok? You know... It is really nice, although painful, when the truth just comes out like that, because it just really reminds us of the fact that we have problems in the legal system itself from the streets to the courts. And the fact that she was so open and honest about what is happening. And she's right. She's not the only one. 
that is the only part about what she had to say, John, that uh, excites me a little bit because I'm glad that she did this very overtly. Mm -hmm. 100%. That is uh, Brianna Strauss, Federal Way Officer. And so we're now finding out what happened to this cop. So uh, shortly after putting up the TikTok, apparently it happened in July, uh, there was a lot of pushback, as you can expect, and the TikTok was taken down. And then an investigation started and we'll show you the consequences that came from that. But first of all, I just love that Brianna Strauss, the officer you saw in that video, apparently describes herself on her LinkedIn resume as having excellent people skills as well as being an excellent leader. So this is a reminder to not trust everything you read on LinkedIn. Anyway, uh, Commander Kurt Schwann of the Federal Way Police Department told Seattle Weekly that in their investigation of Brianna Strauss, they looked for possible violations of standards in the video, as well as if Strauss had any previous disciplinary issues, none were apparently reported. I love how official they have to be about this. We're gonna do an investigation of this TikTok. What are you talking about? Watch it right now. I've got it on my phone. This is unacceptable. And it was unacceptable, kind of. Just a little bit. Strauss received a 10 hour suspension without pay. Viola violations of the social media conduct and personal conduct policies a 10 hour suspension is equal to one shift. So for berating and condescending the people that she's supposed to protect and serve for indicating that she can violate the law if she wants. And if she gets annoyed by you for blocking her way, she'll find a pretense to pull you over, effectively making the law whatever she wants to be. That's a 10 hour suspension, Nina. That's amazing. The fact that what's most troubling is they found no violation of their standards. So guess what? They need some new damn standards. Uh, this speaks to the culture of that police department and people should be very, very afraid. Uh, it makes me call into question previous arrest because yep. if she feels this way about zipping up and down the damn highway, then they feel this way about every other thing. And one final point to this, it reminds me cries that black people have you know the what we have talked about generation after generation when it comes to law enforcement that they can and do in some cases plant things and make things up but nobody wanted to believe the black community on this and thank god for uh, smartphones now but it's still a shame that we need a smartphone to validate what we know has been happening in too many law enforcement agencies for generations. Yep. And that is not to say that all police officers are like her or are corrupt. It is to say that we have systemic problems that need systemic fixes. Yep. Not and her ass should have been suspended for days, John. She should have been suspended for days. I yep. would have fired her though myself. 100%. Yeah. And what I love about this is all too often we have to wait to get video of these cops. In this case, she put that up. She yeah. thought of Confession. that, recorded it, watched it, and thought, I'm killing it. This is a great mm. TikTok. I love that TikTok exists just so people can tell themselves. Anyway, that's oh, all the yeah. time we have for the podcast and for the linear show. But there is the aftermath coming up after the break. So don't go anywhere. We've got some amazing stories to talk about. We're going to be talking about uh, Dark Brandon, Mermaids, a whole bunch of stuff. So we'll see you in just a few. From Mickey C, the silver haired dragon, and her members comments saying, OMG, we love our Nina. Oh, yeah, we love you too, John. <laughs> <laughs> Mine Me was do. not in caps, Nina. Yours was in caps. <laughs> Silver anyway. hair dragon. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. RCR says railroad worker here. Uh, 2008 federal laws that successfully improved safety actually created the untenable working conditions exacerbated by carriers. Yeah, there can always be those ripple effects. The the industry and the government need to follow up on it. That's the issue. We need to be safe and have a life that's worth living. So hopefully that will come about. A member for 21 months says 32 days and counting until an unbossed with Nina Turner begins on October 17th at 4 p.m. Set your calendar and check it out, y'all. And they've got it down like almost a minute. Wait for it to go. Yes, they got to subscribe, John. Tell them, tell all of their family, mm -hmm. their friends, and their frenemies to subscribe to Unbossed. Exactly. Unbossed TYT. You can go to tyt.com slash unbossed TYT to get links to all of it. But also, it's already up on YouTube. Content is being released. You can go subscribe right now and be part of the solution.
Thanks for listening to the full episode of The Damage Report. Support our work, listen ad-free, access members-only bonus content, and more by subscribing to Apple Podcasts at apple.co slash TYT. I'm your host, John Adarola. I'll see you soon.